Appamada's programmes and facilities are supported through your generosity. Your support really does make a huge difference. You'll find a link for contributions on the website at appamada.org forward slash contribute. Thank you so much. Vast is the robe of liberation, a formless field of benefaction. Wearing the universal teaching, I realize the one true nature, thus harmonizing all being. Vast is the robe of liberation, a formless field of benefaction. Wearing the universal teaching, I realize the one true nature, thus harmonizing all being. Vast is the robe of liberation, a formless field of benefaction. Wearing the universal teaching, I realize the one true nature, thus harmonizing all being. Okay, great. And Hey, Mino, it's good to see you. Good to see you too. How's it going? Where are you? Are you um, working right now? On the rock, assume? Yeah, on the rock. I, I still, um, I'm, I'm sort of where we left off, which is that I've, I've pinned, but I haven't started stitching yet. I finally got my thread and uh, I'm looking good. forward to doing the first stitches. Okay, great. Great. Yeah. yeah, excellent. So Lynn, where are you? Where are you working on your rocks? <laughs> I'm still on my tricky little squares. Uh, I've, uh, I've, uh, I was noticing how I, um, you know, that, uh, that part that uh, feels reluctant when something isn't quite working out so beautifully and uh, so I've uh, I kind of recognized that I lost the rhythm the practice if you like so what I've been doing is just doing some stitching practice and uh, and just sitting and letting myself get back into the, the rhythm of it and so now the tricky little squares are um, in place Yeah, and uh, and I'm going to uh, stitch oh, yeah. them. Yeah, so you basted them around the center. It looks like in the center. So because you have uh -huh. to, you have to stitch so close to the edge, don't you? So I exactly. So I I basted them in the center so that they sort of stay hopefully in place, and then I can oh, go yeah. around the edge yeah. of them. And. Good. Uh, so we'll see. We'll see how they go. <laughs> yeah, that's really wise to go back to something. It's almost like in Zazen when you go back to counting your breath. Mm. You know, something that you're very, your body and your mind are very familiar with, and it's kind of it's calming in a way to mm. to go back to just stitching. Just, just stitch. stitching. Yeah, yeah, just rim and because with the squares you you haven't got the rhythm of the of the stitching in the same way. Yeah. It's more like a stab stitch, isn't it? So so yeah. it's kind yeah. of like um, yeah, so anyway. Yeah, totally <laughs> different rhythm, yeah. Yeah. Well good, great. Yeah, those are they're tiny though, so they <laughs> that's good. <laughs> the Thank you.
So Trudy, what's up? You must be doing your pine needle stitch, I would guess. No, I've um, I've had COVID, I think, like, or got COVID still. So, um, uh. <laughs> but I have completed one strap. <laughs> so um, I realized uh, I'd, I'd measured the two millimeter, milliliters, whatever they are, the tiny mills from the edge of the strap and sewn it there but then I'd folded it on the sewn line because that's what I'm used to doing so I had to unpick my um, interfacing and and re get the fold on the original fold line um, so I've um, I've done that now and so the first strap is done Sorry, you can see the seam from one side, but you can't see it from the other. Yeah, so there's the fold there, and then the seam is sort of tucked into the little gully. Yeah, yeah. yeah so exactly. you can't actually see the seam. It's kind of tucked inside, which is... Right. I, I realized at three o'clock in the morning I'd folded it wrong. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so I had that, you know, how you go over things, so... Um, I, I undid the interfacing and refolded. Oh man. Yeah. But that's, that's a little picky kind of nuance that they don't, uh, the final thing should be a solid piece, not see a seam. That's right. I hadn't realized, I mean, I hadn't realized that's what that little sort of gully was for. So yeah. uh, now I get it. So uh, great this is everybody that's here gets it this is yes. wonderful yeah. <laughs> Be helpful. I you hope can't you... see the stitching it's very ingenious um, i hope but... you feel better soon oh uh, me too it'll pass yeah. won't it um so i uh, i think today i'll be doing the uh, i'll just start measuring and sewing the other strap and then um probably won't be doing the the neck piece till after Christmas. Yeah. Good. Okay, great. That sounds good. Great. Yeah. So Rosemary, how's the frame? Uh, well, it's um, where it was when I um, showed you that. Well, have one, everybody. Uh, uh, yay, <laughs> thank you. Um, but I was uh, sick too, so um, I didn't. Um, so pinning, I'm gonna be pinning now those um, corners. And my question is, I think I understand, you're, you're sewing up to one corner, then down the back. So I'm going to pin um, both sides of the one corner at the same, you know, first, before going to the others, right? Yeah, exactly. And you're, you're making sure that when you pin, you've got the, that extra piece, you know, that dog ear facing the right way, facing the correct way. So you're, I, yeah. I did look at page seven and I, yeah. so far they look right. Good, great. Yeah, that's that's got lots of instructions. That part has lots of instructions. Yeah, and, and um, the um, looking at it online, you, the pictures show so much better than the printed one. So, uh, so I've, I've gone back to looking at the instructions online because um, the, um, the backlight of the screen really shows the pictures so much better than the printed one. So good. Yeah, that helped, that helped a lot, too. Good, good. That's good to know that you get to see a little better what the detail is. Yeah, yeah. All right. Thank I'm you. I'm sorry you've been sick. <laughs> yeah, well, I didn't have COVID and I'm so grateful for that. Oh, man. That's how I'm looking at it. 
Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So, Miss Maria. Hi. Yeah, um, I'm still making my way around the first. Ah. Uh, in a line of the um you know the first in a in a line right and i just have a lot of trouble trying to get it right so i took one of lynn's tips of practicing sewing through um a few layers you know That's to get good. used to that kind of um feeling of it because i was just um doing it and unpicking doing and trying to be patient with myself about it and kind with myself you know oh god i've got to do it again <laughs> <laughs> kind of just watching that you know and thinking oh oh should i just leave it is it good enough i'm like no it isn't really you do need to <laughs> it do it again <laughs> you know so yeah so just kind of working on kind of the practical oh, wow. of stitching it and also the kind of approach of the frustration of not being able to get it right yeah that's where yeah. I'm with that yeah that's very um Gosh, it's such a, a feeling, you know, it's such a, it reminds me of, um, I don't know who I heard say this recently or, or they were quoting, but to put your awareness in your entire body and it really ends up being in your fingers, in your hand, that this real fine awareness of how many pieces of fabric, what kind of fabric am I going through yeah mm, yeah <sighs> be helpful to have that in my head <laughs> what mm. you've just said yeah thank you right well does anyone have any questions anything that before they start so and they wanted to yeah me no I wanted to ask some really simple questions before I start this first um, stitch. Um, so uh, I understand that I should be sewing with the side A as the front. So um, I'll be sewing through the, the pinned line of side A with side B being the back of the stitch. Um, the instructions say on page uh, five that the stitches when they appear on side B should be in the seam allowance and not on the chalk line. But I'm guessing that's because of the little offset, which we, which um, John and I discussed and we decided not to do. Is that right? So mine will appear pretty much right over the chalk line. Right, you're on page five. Let me look at what that says. I'm looking at yeah, I'll join the bottom of page, of page four and top of page five. Bottom of page four, this shows the, the chalk lines in this. Uh, okay, stitches dashed line are in the seam allowance of B and not on. Yeah, you're right. That's exactly right. I was, okay. it's funny, I was doing laundry the other day and I was folding bath mats. And I was realizing that was what they're talking about. And it works if it's a really thick material. But when it's thin like this, it's it's probably really minuscule. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we talked about it yeah. uh, the other week and we decided on this. Good. It, it seems it seems maybe just simpler all around to not have to absolutely think about. simpler. We'll, we'll see what yeah. happens. Yeah, yeah. Um, and my only other question um, is like, I'll be beginning in the seam allowance uh, with the knot on the back side. Uh, should I try and get particularly far out in the seam allowance or just begin no. right on the corner? Right. I would say okay. begin right on the corner or maybe okay, one great. stitch away, one stitch mm -hmm. to the outside of the corner. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. Okay. okay. I'm going to do some practice stitches first and then I'll Great. start on that. Great. Yeah.
Well, I have a book that's called The Truth of This Life. That's Dharma talks by a teacher, Catherine Thanis, who was a student of Suzuki Roshi's and then became the leading teacher at the Santa Cruz Zen Center. Um, she's since died. Um, but I thought it would be nice to read something from somebody that I don't know very much about, but um, is a very experienced teacher. Oh, this one is for Maria. <laughs> The name of the Dharma talk is No Pressure to Improve. Each um, moment arises as the world, as a world of echoes. You are sitting with your breath, listening to your thoughts, following your thoughts, forgetting thoughts. The world of echoes arises. What would it be like to sit in Zazen and go beyond? Think non-thoughts. As soon as they arise, they dissolve, leave no trace. All these thoughts you have been having about your knees or about your meal, or about your family, your job, worries about the future, regrets about the past. As soon as these thoughts come up, they pass. Nothing hooks them. Although that's actually what is happening. Habits of mind resemble certain thoughts, reassemble certain thoughts pretty quickly. It's called reenactment. Thoughts repeat themselves again and again, unless there really is no hook in the mind. The thing about reality is that there's no later, there's no next moment when one is going to be enlightened when one is going to understand non-being, for there's no outside, no second moment, only infinite first moments arising as now. If you recognize this as the way the universe is, everything coming and going, not belonging to anyone, that's the universe of not self a sense of space. This is the secret to Buddhist practice. Do you have a question, Mino? You're just looking at the screen. Okay, that's fine. What we are studying is the mind, not Catherine's mind, but the mind arising as Catherine. When Catherine can hear and accept everything that's going on in her mind, she can hear and accept everything that's going on in anybody's mind. Nothing is outside her mind. In that mind, there is no pressure to improve Catherine. It is to be without anxiety about non-perfection as Sinkan says. From that place, there's no anxiety about right or wrong. And yet there is complete understanding of causes and consequences. Someone said recently she had noticed that when she comes close to something important, she veers off. 
this is an important awareness. What does it take to go straight ahead? To notice the moments when we veer off. How much effort is enough? What's too hard? Our life can be measured in moments of backing off or going straight ahead. Backing off of conflict, difficulty, frustration, fear, or a willingness to trust and go with the moment. Not because it's comfortable, but because it's there. When we're most completely ourselves, we're most completely free of ourselves. But you can't think about it. You have to completely be the complicated, mysterious being that each of us is and is embarrassed by. Is there anyone here who's not embarrassed by the completely enigmatic, mysterious being you are? As long as we're embarrassed, there's a self there. There's a defense, some resistance. How about being willing to be embarrassed, to be resistant, to be either? Stop veering off. You have to go into it. You take a little step toward it. Then take another little step. You go as slowly as you need to. You might come right in and put your nose down close to it, but maybe you don't wanna get that close. You can only do what your stomach can do. So you do it slowly at the pace at which your stomach and your heart can handle it. When we get really tight and solid, so does the energy of fear. If you become relaxed and just sit there with the fear, inhaling and exhaling, fear is going to relax too. It might change shape, it might get smaller or bigger, but it's never going to be bigger than you because it's your energy. Fear is never greater than your body. So what we have to do when our heart is ready, when our mind and our stomach are ready, is to get up close inside it, breathe it, smell it. Mind has to bring fear back into the body because it's the mind that put fear outside. It's the mind that says, I'm not going to acknowledge that fear or work with it. You allow your consciousness to experience the sensation and you stay with it. Don't go someplace else in your mind and wish it would go away. You enter the experience with an inhalation, with an exhalation. You feel the coldness the movement, the solidity, or the dissolution with a quiet, steady mind. The joy of not choosing. In Ram Dass's book, Still Here, he describes a trip to India on a very slow train. He became impatient, thinking this trip is going to go on forever. This present moment will never end. I've been on this train my entire life and I will never get off. Now what? As he meditated on these thoughts, he began to surrender into the rhythms of the train, slowly dropping his anger. He noticed the part of himself that yearned to slow down, to move to the rhythms of earth and sky, the coming and going of generations. 
and he also noticed the part of himself raised in the West, accustomed to material life and great stimulation. He wrote, I saw these two aspects in stark relief and wondered which of these parts was actually me. During my early sessions at Tassahara, I had an experience like that. Our sitting periods were 40 minutes long and you learned a sense by how your body felt just when it was time for the bell to end the period. And when the pain was really strong, you would find yourself anticipating the bell, barely holding on until the period was over. Many periods I couldn't imagine going a minute past 40. And then one day, the bell did not sound. I kept thinking, any time now. But minutes went by and I gradually realized that the bell wasn't going to sound. At first, there was panic. And then very unexpectedly release came, release into just sitting there, the holding on, the wanting to be out of that experience was creating more tension. Accepting and releasing into just what is, is the homeopathy of Zen. Being willing to settle into just this experience. This is the teaching of saying yes to our life, not giving in to thoughts of another life. We learn that our resistance strengthens whatever we want to avoid. Trying on the attitude of yes is the not knowing mind, whereas the conditioned mind creates conditioned. This is too much or not enough. No way I'm going to stay in this situation. Not knowing mind is willing to know and feel whatever is happening. Recently, I was thinking about a difficult situation in my life, trying to find a way to make it acceptable. For days, I would think about it, invite my mind to reimagine it in a less painful way. After weeks of trying, I realized I'm helpless. I can't solve this by myself. I just have to be it. That realization was an enormous relief. Like Ram Dass saying, I'm going to be on this train forever. I settled into my own circumstances. There isn't anything I can do about this situation. There is no way to escape it. I must live with it and let it become digested and transformed internally on its own. Thinking I had to solve the problem had become the problem. When we are experiencing strong pain in session, be willing to know the pain and the release into it is more helpful than trying to escape move, wiggle. Every moment to escape the pain eventually results in a return of the pain. Being willing to know and experience the pain is the letting go. In Kazuaki Tanahashi's translation, The True Dharma I, the great master Dongshan was asked by a monk, when cold or heat come, how can we avoid it? Dongshan, why don't you go to the place where there is no cold or heat? Monk, what is the place where there is no cold or heat? Dongshan, when it is cold, let the cold kill you. When it is hot, let the hot kill you. This koan tells us to take the situation as a meditation, not as a problem. 
the composer John Cage made a spiritual practice of creating sound compositions. He knew that he could only compose as a practice if he did it non-intentionally. But if he tried to do something, it would just be another expression of ego. Cage had heard D.T. Suzuki lecture at Columbia University in the 1940s. And during those talks, Cage gained insight into what had already become his method. Suzuki drew a circle on the blackboard and sectioned off a bit of it with two parallel lines. The full circle stood for the full range of the unconditioned mind. The smaller part between the parallel lines stood for ego. Cage remembers that Suzuki said, the ego can cut itself off from the big mind. It is by our likes and dislikes that we cut ourselves off from the unconditioned mind. Lewis Hyde, in his book, Trickster Makes This World, said, likes and dislikes are the lap dogs and guard dogs of the ego busy all the time, panting and barking at the gates of attachment and aversion, and thereby narrowing perception and experience. In our five-day session practice, we let go of the lap dogs by not picking and choosing, by eating what's offered, by not pointing to something in the salad that we'd rather have because such choices reinforce the ego. We can learn that it doesn't really matter what we eat, what work we do, who our assigned roommate is, or what time we get up. Simply going with conditions allows our mind to remain calm and ready for whatever may happen next. John Cage tried to create music without choosing sounds, without having preferences. He wanted everything to be the chance operation of the universe, so he would flip a coin. He took four years to compose a five minute piece because everything had to be decided by chance rather by, than by intention. There are times when I have done a similar practice turning toward whatever comes along. It has always been more interesting than when I follow my own preferences. If I have the opportunity to continue working, Cage says and conversing with Cage, I think the work will resemble more and more, not the work of a person, but something that might've happened, even if the person weren't there. He would spend months tossing coins and working with the I Ching to create a score. He believed the highest discipline is the discipline of chance operations because chance operations have absolutely nothing to do with one's likes or dislikes. The person is being disciplined, not the work. The person is being disciplined away from the ego's habitual attitudes toward a fundamental change of consciousness. There was once an Europa poetry reading where many big name poets read. Competition was in the air. Only one poet seemed non-competitive. Peter Orlovsky went through his notebook and read some notes. It was not especially interesting, someone recalled, but just a piece of his mind. But after the event, that was the one poet this person remembered. Lewis Hyde writes of attending a lecture by John Cage, which was a co collage of text fragments drawn from Thoreau, Emerson, the Wall Street Journal, older lectures of his own, assembled and ordered through a series of chance operations. Finding it rather uninteresting, Hyde left early, but as he walked away, he found himself unable to forget the experience. 
he heard more clearly the sounds of a city, honking of horns, passing traffic, fragments of conversation by passersby and from car radios. His attention was tuned to the randomness and chance selection and not the trying to impress. He noticed that it had made a big impression. When you are listening for, for something, there is effort involved, the strain of blocking out. But when you stop trying to listen, there can be deep release and an increase in hearing. Try this yourselves. I felt like this increased ability to hear was the joy of letting the world in, wrote Hyde. Catch the body as it flies. Some years ago, while preparing to visit a friend in Taos, I discovered that while she was giving me driving directions on the phone, I was creating a mental map on the road of the road. Once in a car, I found myself following the map in my mind rather than directions she had given me. This was a problem because I wasn't finding my mind's image in the darkening countryside. And when I came to road junctures, I wasn't clear what to do. When I finally arrived, my friend recognized my behavior as familiar, something she did herself. It seems we develop mental images of reality. Those images become reality for us. Internal images have great power compared to those outside of our mind. Since that time, I found other occasions when my inner voices are stronger than those outside, such that I don't hear what is actually being said by others. So I begin to pay attention to the static in my own mind, the ongoing self-talk. It's similar to what Suzuki Roshi once said, you are hearing my voice, but you are listening to the sound of your own consciousness. Notice this with people we are training as chant leaders. No matter how carefully or repeatedly we may give instruction about chanting Japanese style, students often have an idea in their mind of how to chant. And this idea interferes with their being able to hear some other possibility. Sometimes there is anxiety in someone's body or mind. Sometimes there is an internal imperative based on earlier training. We have a wonderful student who has a strong, clear voice, but no matter how often or carefully we demonstrate our style, his inner conviction persuades him otherwise. I've been thinking with renewed interest how difficult it is to see or hear clearly. Settling the mind allows us to see things as they really are, relatively free of emotional or intellectual biases. Clear seeing may not happen the first time we sit, but maybe it will. Our chances increase with repeated sitting and continuous effort to calm the mind. The question becomes, what is seeing clearly? What do we see? How do we actually, how do things actually exist? It is a fundamental teaching of Buddhism that all things, people, objects, circumstances, exist impermanently, have no inherent existence, and therefore cannot bring lasting satisfaction. When we see clearly, we see that things are simply the coming together and passing away of circumstances and conditions. This is what is meant as empty of inherent existence, no fixed identity or appearance. Therefore, we live in a condition of continuous restlessness or dissatisfaction. When I originally encountered the great failure 
by Natalie Goldberg four years ago. I had resistance to reading it. I didn't really want to read about events years prior that cast a much respected teacher in a negative light. More recently, I decided to reread it. And now in a different frame of mind, I found it quite instructive and helpful, even tender. We resist seeing or hearing things we are opposed to or are afraid of. When we try, we find it harder than we imagine to settle the mind enough to let in what we resist or feel threatened by. I find it especially difficult to listen to political opinions or perspectives different from my own. But I think how good it would be to be able to hear things that I don't agree with, to let in thoughts and feelings that represent some perspective that feels threatening to me, that I don't wish to exist in the world. It's as if by not listening, we deny the existence of that perspective. I don't minimize the complexity of this. Our practice of sitting quietly and opening ourselves to the world is very profound, subtle practice that requires inner stability and a willingness to see how our mind allows only what is acceptable or safe into our awareness. How does this practice really help us then? we can't really do it. Fundamentally, the practice calls attention to that which we can't do. And maybe that's its primary function, to reveal to us how attached we are to the self and how difficult it is to see the world outside of the preferences we create. It's as if the practice of generosity shows us how ungenerous we are or how the practice of mindfulness shows us all the ways in which we aren't attentive, generous, gentle, or kind. I think I was able to read The Great Failure now and to read it with my heart, not just with my mind, because I had experienced some sense of failure in myself that was different from, but related to the failure she is presenting in the book. Until you have experienced yourself as disappointing yourself or others, you can't really read about such an event in someone else's life with empathy because someone else's life is just a story to you. No empathy needs to come forth. In Katagiri Roshi's book on time, each moment is the universe. He says real time is completely beyond our idea of time. This is like saying real zazen is completely beyond our idea of zazen, or actual life is completely beyond our ideas about our life. We know that's true, perhaps also reassuring and unsettling. For instance, even though we give detailed zazen instruction, we know that zazen is completely beyond our description of it. We give the basic teaching up front, and then there is the teaching from the back, the truth we discover when we try to do the teaching from the front. We don't know what our teaching from the back is. We discover that along the way. Zen teaches kill the Buddha, kill your father or your mother, kill the teacher. We have to do that. We do it the best we can. It doesn't mean that literally, of course. When we objectify our experience, we tell stories about our lives and the lives of others. The purpose of studying Buddhism is to see ourselves doing that and to free ourselves from the habit. Although our culture rewards us for being verbal and quick-witted, the deeper truth is to know that things are more complex and subtle and insubstantial than our quick minds can grasp. 
the Korean Zen teacher, Sing Shan, called it, don't know mind. This challenges us to know breath as breath, sound as sound, sight as sight, taste as taste, smell as smell. Can we see our mind picking and choosing as it's forming these sense experiences, which are not separate from our ideas and thoughts and feelings? The practice lets us see how we alter experience as it arises. The voices of life are just arising and passing. They don't really satisfy us in the ways our hunger may want to be satisfied. Instead, we grab onto things to find pleasure or frustration, something, anything, to engage our feelings and thoughts. Buddhist teachers tell us we decorate our life with our thoughts and feelings and that life itself is just arising and passing. But perhaps life is not capable of satisfying your deep hunger for something good to hang on to, or not in the way we think we want to. Knowing that truth is deeply satisfying. Now, almost 20 years after his passing, we understand Katagiri Roshi was making a great effort to bring us the authentic teaching of impermanence. There is nothing solid in our lives. And we're always chasing after things, trying to catch them as they fly by. Cultivating the silent mind. We seem to need pauses around things. Before I begin my talk, I settle myself on my cushion, just as you have all settled yourselves, and then we chant. Chanting is a ritual pause. It is also an activity complete in itself. If I begin to speak immediately after entering, you might not be ready to listen, and I might not be ready to speak. Readiness takes time. That is, readiness to be wholeheartedly and undividedly here. The space between words allows us to discern the words. Silence is in the notes of music and also around them, like the breath in words we speak. You cannot have a word without the silence around it. You cannot have music without the silence in it. The silence inside our minds allows us to hear ourselves. There's a Zen story from Thomas Cleary's translation of the Book of Serenity. One day, Yun Yan was sweeping the ground. Dao Wu said, too busy. These are two old Dharma brothers testing each other. Yun Yan said, you should know there's one who isn't busy. Yunyan was referring to the deep, quiet mind that is always present, even in the midst of activity. In this story, that settled mind is called the one who is not busy. Do you know that mind, how to find it, even in the midst of being busy? That mind is always with us. Zen practice directs us to that quality of mind that simply observes. It is called the not knowing mind, the awake mind, the mind of readiness. At first we cultivate that mind in our meditation room and then we bring it to each situation in our lives. In the last mindfulness class, one student told us about a difficult conversation she had had that week during which she had practiced just watching 
her breath, and her physical sensations. Instead of her usual reactions to being criticized, she said, the practice of just watching her body tense, her breath constrict, and her feelings that came up allowed her to remain in the situation. As a result, she had a much different conversation than she otherwise would have had. That was an example of cultivating the mind that is not busy. In this new robe that I'm wearing, this is a new robe that I'm wearing. It is beginning to fold just the way my old robe did. I would prefer that it wouldn't fold so predictably like this. It didn't fold until I put it on. The weight and shape of the cloth, the pattern, how it's sewn, and how I move my body create the folds. And once the folds are in, they're in. Each time I wear it, it folds in the same place. The folds will not disappear, even when the robe is ironed. As I'm noticing this, I'm going, oh, this looks just like my old robe. This is the third day I'm wearing it, and it's already taking a familiar shape. Causal conditions. We took our shape very early thanks to our biology, environment, family context, our karmic conditionings. When we are willing to be creased in a certain way and keep doing it, it's hard to uncrease us. We have learned to turn and bend a certain way. Because that way is natural now, it is hard to divert us. These are the moments when we define the self. I want this, I feel this, I must do it this way. This is the arising of the conditioned mind. There are other moments of direct knowing when we slip in and out of events smoothly without conditioned mind impeding. If it is a conditioned moment, we might inquire whether some fear is at its root a fear that requires that I fold in this particular way. These creases are burned into our nervous system. That's how deep they are. A good way to study the conditions in which we want things to appear or not to appear is through working with pain, the sensation of burning, throbbing, hot, stretching, tearing, however it is arising for you. That happens when consciousness dares to enter. What happens when consciousness dares to enter into this throbbing, burning sensation? When you enter the shape of pain, you go past the shape in your mind. You go past the aversion and fear in your mind. This direct experience lacks aversion and fear. There is simply direct knowing. When a part of consciousness isn't holding out saying, oh, do I have to do this? Your whole being is hot, throbbing on the verge. It's on the threshold because you have entered the shape of pain in your mind. That experience goes beyond the appearance and non-appearance of conditions. You're right on the margin where your authentic life actually exists. To meet that which we cannot know. In Zazen, we try to find a stable physical position so we can listen to the voices of the mind and know the sensations of the body. If these voices or sensations remain unrecognized, they control us. And we may feel we don't understand why things are so complicated or unworkable in our lives. As we continue to practice us and we begin to understand that our own mind is making up the appearance of the world and also reacting to it. Gradually understanding this, 
the mind is not so disturbed by itself and begins to relax. When we begin to acknowledge some deep taste from Zazen, some deep taste of our life. This is not something we can talk about because we do not have language for it. Trying to explain sitting misses the mark. Gradually we learn to trust that which we cannot say and we recognize the unsayable as our deep wisdom, the stronger voice within. When your full energy is available, we see how our thoughts and feelings have created the separate and suffering self. We say suffering because this self feels isolated and does not recognize its interdependent nature, how it exists in cooperation with everything. Again and again in Zazen, we see separation. Our mind may be commenting, Zazen is great, or this is impossible, or I wonder if I'm doing it right. It feels as if there is no, as if there is one who thinks and that which is thought about. No matter how long we look, we cannot find the thinker. We recognize that we have been arguing or discussing totally inside our own mind. All the inner voices are created by our own mind. We begin to listen to our thinking as the creative activity of our own consciousness, rather than some trustworthy voice inside. When we find that we are thinking, planning, or remembering in Zazen, we wake up and come back to inhalation and exhalation. Each time we return to inhalation, exhalation, we interrupt the conditioned pattern of the mind. Each time we leave our storyline to return to the breath, we strengthen our awareness that breathing is what is actually happening and storytelling is our fictional life. We acknowledge our thoughts and reactions as our storytelling mind, rather than what is actually happening. We learn there is no outside. We also pay attention to the sensations of the body without doing anything about them. As much as possible, we don't move away from them we don't judge, interpret, or comment on them. Sensations are not right or wrong. We practice to see, see what is right in front of our face. We gradually become intimate with the consciousness we are, which we inherited when we took birth. Our karmic stream is neither good nor bad. Your relationships tend to be smooth or awkward for you. Do you trip going down the street, trailing too many packages, too many tasks? Karmic predispositions. Can we acknowledge all this with a neutral and interested mind? We are 100% individual and 100% a member of the community. We exist independently of all the projections people have of us and things are independent of our projections of them. And yet the way that things exist is ultimately the same for all of us. We are members of the same community. Because we experience that things change, we begin to see that there isn't anything to hold on to. Each situation is its own unique universe of causes and conditions. We begin to talk differently, hold opinions provisionally, and not take ourselves so seriously. We help each other let go of our self-righteousness. Our attachment to the separate self weakens. We sit 
to meet that which we cannot know and to be willing to see everything, all the scenery of our consciousness along the way. It is a great relief to begin to live our life in accordance with reality as it is, rather than reality as we create it. Everyone looks like they're moving along. No stopping, right. Very concentrated. Yeah, them reading. Something miraculous has happened while you were doing them reading. <laughs> them. Oh actually, no. <laughs> I've actually completed a whole, the whole line. All right. And it's like, wow, just something really settled. And I was able to just really just, I don't know. I, I haven't been able to do it for over a month. I've been unpicking, picking, unpicking. Wow. Very frustrated, but something settled. And I've just been able to ah. really and feel the click of the, um, what do you call it? That that material that's just in front of the silk. That's silk, yeah. And feel the click of that. So knowing when I'm, you know, when it's not to go to the silk and, just really feeling through, like you said before, and uh, yeah, and just yeah, just not thinking. <laughs> yeah, I wonder. Um, I mean, I realize that the form is really to do the um, mantra, Namakiya Butsu, with every stitch. But sometimes, um, yeah, listening to something else, it kind of uh, you. I don't um, pay as much attention to what I'm thinking about. Yeah. I'm listening to something else. Yeah, I think it settled those parts that were kind of trying to get it right and not getting it right. And, you know, yeah. just just do it. I just started doing it. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm amazed, actually. It's great. Because, a whole, yeah. It's possible. <laughs> I just, I don't know what it was. I just couldn't do it. And it just didn't seem possible. And it was like, why? I've done the stitch everywhere else on the Rakasi. Why can't I do it round this edge? What is going on? My brain would not comprehend it. And then it's let go uh, of something. I think when I was listening to you, something's let go and I've just been able to get, uh, back, get back into the stitch and the layers uh, and really feel my way, my way yeah. through stitch but i'm very i'm amazed because yeah, I thought, <laughs> it's wonderful I didn't have to give up because i just can't do this <laughs> ah really this one part i'm gonna throw it all in because <laughs> i can't do it and, and, and maria you oh. you have ann's voice on tape so if you ever need to <laughs> oh. if anyone's doing these lines go back to this tape and listen to them readings <laughs> really yeah uh, so last week i was doing the running stitch so i i wasn't you know doing the chant so i um i i have this on youtube there's um a recording of zen mind beginner's mind read by um peter um coyote yeah thank you that was so nice doing the running stitch listening to him read um Zen mind, beginner's mind. It was really a nice, nice thing to to have while I was doing the running stitch. Oh wow! I hadn't realized that was out there. Yeah, yeah. he has a really nice voice. Yeah, yeah. I'll um, I can I can send it over the link. Um, yeah, that sounds very. Yeah, it's um, really nice. I while I've been sick, I've been knitting a lot because I really love to knit and um. So I listen to audiobooks a lot of times while I'm knitting. And that would be a nice one to listen to. Yeah. And I love the part of one of the talks you were saying about, you know, your energy is not bigger than you. Your anxiety is not bigger than you. It's part of your body. It's part of you. It's not bigger than you. And it was kind of something at that point, I kind of like this Rakasu isn't bigger than me. We can meet each other. <laughs> You can really see each other. Oh, so thank yeah. you. Yeah. 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 Well, I hate to just, um, that's my preference. I, I feel 
uh, badly just sitting here silently while you guys sew, but um, so I've kind of picked up reading, but I'm sure sitting here silently, everybody's, you know, you have the chance then to more focus on the mantra. I have a, a just such gratitude for you being there, Anne, whether it's silent or reading, it feels like <laughs> such a, a benevolent presence. <laughs> oh, good. Good. Yeah, that's nice. And it does because it kind of it's holding me here, you know, because I get frustrated and you get difficult bits. You being here holds me in the space, you know, to carry on. Yeah. You know, and kind of, oh, gosh, I can't do this and just kind right. of. Right. I'm going to drop it here. I'm going to leave it. Yeah. 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 To have this time where you think, OK, this is what I'm doing. The people here are doing the same thing. You know, this is kind of. Do people sew on their own? Do people sew away from these? Yeah, so Linda. Do. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've tried. Yeah, <laughs> this line. yeah I Amina, you too. will. Yeah, you'll, you'll, you will. It's, I don't know. It's, um, well, it's different for everybody. I think about some people that had never sewed before and how hard that's been for them. It, it's really, really difficult. It's not an easy um, fine motor skill. And we don't really have many fine motor skills, a lot of us now, the work we do, the, you know, the things we do day by day. We don't have a lot of things where we're you know, feeling with our fingertips how many layers of fabric a needle is going through. That's pretty... It's pretty finely tuned, but you you get it. It's cool. It's like learning to dance. You you get it. I mean, it is, isn't it? it? Really, is like learning to dance, isn't it? The steps and all the different nuances. Yeah, yeah. and how it's just a jumble to begin with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think the equivalent of my doing trying to do that line was stepping on toes dancing. <laughs> uh, I have a question. Uh -huh. Sort of uh, to to set me up. Yeah. Not something I'm doing right now, but I've I've got uh, I've stitched across on two of the panels. Um, okay, so you're doing exciting. the line on like on one and then on two and then on you're doing the first line on several of the pairs. Right. Yeah, so, I've done two of the pairs now. So I've got okay. I figured I'd go in order of the numbers just so that I so I've done one A, I've done one A and one B together and two A and two B. Mm -hmm. Um so I'll, uh, and I think they've turned out well. I had to un unstitch and restitch and unstitch and restitch. Um, to, I'm like, oh no, I'm uh, setting a precedent with what my stitch looks like now. <laughs> Got it. Because like, because on the practice lines, you know, each line kind of ends up a little bit different. It's nice, for me. yeah. Even even though even if they're even within themselves. Um, so I know that once I've sewn all these lines, then I'll. Um, then I'll do the sort of folding out and, and ironing. The folding and then folding under that little seam allowance, the folding and ironing, uh -huh. and then folding under the seam allowance for A uh -huh. and, and ironing that and lining it up exactly with the line on B. Okay. Yeah, and painting. And it. when I do that ironing, should I be trying to sort of make it uh, like taut against the seam, or just naturally how it falls? I... Mm, good question. Um, when I iron, first I iron the seam open. Does that make sense? So the two sides of the fabric that you've joined with the seam, you put open. And you fold the seam open first. Okay. And then you fold it over. And you don't need to pull it. 
No. I mean, you might, you okay. straighten it. Right. But you don't need to, you know, to make sure that the, the lines are very. Yeah. When you say straighten it to make sure that the two panels are in parallel to each other. Right. 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 Okay. Yeah. And then it's nice and flat. Okay. And when I fold, I, I haven't read that far ahead, I guess, when I fold under the seam allowance of the A panels, right? am I folding right on that chalk line? Yes. Okay, so the chalk line should be in, in the, the apex of the, the fold. The fold. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so you don't, you don't really want to see it, you know, but mm. when you sew it, you, you know, if you really, Took a microscope and looked at it you would see it but um it's going to be on the curve gotcha. of that fold does anybody else have any particular instruction or advice for me know about this part i mean especially about the tension when you're when you're ironing are people pulling a lot of putting a lot of tension? I don't. I mean, I try to make it nice and flat, but I don't try to pull it out. No, I didn't try and kind of spread it. I think I ironed it sort of a little tucked. I think the only mm -hmm. reason I the reason I asked about that is because when John was talking to me about the offset versus right on, but mm -hmm. you know, the line. I thought that he'd said something about sort of make sure budging it in a way to since since we're sewing right lined up that right exactly it had to be I but I don't know it's just something he might have been referring to something else. There's lots of little adjusting, and I'm I'm always relieved when I read that in the instructions too, but there's a lot of you know you'll. Um, you kind of adjust it, you kind of shift one thing and it's not going to be, it's not going to be exactly lined up. I mean, Just you because, remember it's, because working, it's fabric, because it's fabric. Yeah. And you had to yeah. lay it out flat to measure it. But even when you lay a piece of fabric out flat, you know, it's not, it's going up and down on the table. It's wavy. So wait till you get to the silk. <laughs> oh that lining of the i mean that's a really that's a really good thing to think about i mean when you think about what would i like to use for the lining of my envelope because i had sort of forgotten well, I had used something that Peg had when I first made the envelope for my Rakasu. And then I I got a spot of ink on my envelope somehow. And I made another envelope. And so I chose something that I really loved the color and I really loved the, the hand, the feel of it. And it's something called silk charmeuse, which is real nice and smooth, and but it's pretty thin. And it's real nice and slippery, very hard to measure and cut, very hard. I mean, I had to pin it to another piece of fabric, like pin it to some denim in order to keep it still so I could measure it and cut it. And I felt so bad for the people that I was with when I first started this group because I helped them order their silk. And I was all about, yeah, make it something that's really slippery because you want the Rakasu to go in and out. And so poor Trent did the same thing that I did. I mean, he got this really nice piece of silk if you're making a nightgown or a slip, but it was really hard to work with. And he did a great job. Is there any um, ruling, Anne, about uh, ruling? <laughs> I don't know. You know what I mean. Is there any uh, uh, sense of what you should use to line your envelope? Does it have any? 
Well, wow. the the instructions that I'm aware of are silk, mm -hmm. but I also am aware of a place where they say you can use synthetic satin or you know something. But basically, it's something that makes it easy to slip a folded up rakasu in and out. I will tell you that John was contrary about this and use something that's very textured. It's silk, but it's really um, coarsely woven. It's like a raw silk. Right. And I've used his rakasu a few times. You really have to work to get the rakasu in and out of that. <laughs> Beside the fact that he's so tall, that the straps are really long. And so you have to kind of fold it and fold it and get it inside. <laughs> but that's what he wanted to do. He was really set on it. He didn't like any of the slippery stuff. But so no, there's um I encourage people to get something that's a little stiff. So you're not you're not having to hold down this slippery eel of a piece of fabric um, but it works I mean you can do it I will send out an email about the website that I bought silk from okay. I know Trudy's got her own piece yeah which is really nice um, I, I got a piece off eBay so I got a big piece that I've um, been wrapping my rakasu in uh, you know, to look after it, but also we realized that I could share it with Catherine. So um, great, because yeah. I'm sewing her uh, rakasu, then I'll yeah. use it for the inside of her envelope and also for my own envelope. Um, I don't know if the silk for the outside of my envelope will arrive at it's, any point. It will. It's cotton. It's it's oh. the same cotton as yeah as the rakan suit. So right. it's just that pine green. Um, yeah, I've been thinking about making uh, an envelope, a larger envelope for the envelope because I see the teacher specifically don't leave their rakasus at the physical address of Apamata. They bring them. And Joel found this really nice little um, container that looks like it's a, it's a laptop or a notebook, you know, a, a computer notebook container. It's got a zipper and it's kind of neoprene or something like that, kind of plasticky. And um, Lori uses her Ziploc bag. Mm. And um, I and Todd, I'm not sure how Todd carries his around, but I was thinking about getting some uh, oil cloth that you make like tablecloths out of and basically using the same design. And that would be something that would keep it dry if you were having to walk through the rain. Oh, it's so thoughtful. Yeah. That's lovely. Something like that. Any tips on sewing up into the corner, into the tip? It's really hard getting up in there. It's a really pain, yeah. Just patience, I guess. Yeah, and trying to kind of think about, okay, where is my last stitch gonna fall? You know, sort of planning that before you get to the corner, to the tip and have to go down the other side. But, mm -hmm. okay. um, Maria looks like she has an idea <laughs> about how she did that, how you yeah. sewed those corners. Oh, you mean getting your needle through the very tip? I just yeah. put my finger through and then kind of followed the needle up to it, if you like. And I put a pencil in as well. I put a pencil up to make the corner more kind of pointy and then followed the needle up through so it came and it might take one or two goes but you get it right through the tip in the end thank you 
if you, I was just thinking as she said that you could use the corner of a ruler too. If you've got a nice flat, thin ruler, you could insert that. Then you've got something else up there besides your hand and the needle though. So that's- To lean on, it. yeah. Thank you. That's, let me see what I got. No, I was kind of sat there thinking, I don't know how I've done two lines when I haven't been able to do them for like five weeks. All right, all right. You're over the hump, whatever Just, it was. Oh, I'll have another one, no doubt. <laughs> it was a rest. It was a rest. It was a rejuvenation. I was just thinking of Judy doing a strap, so I'm thinking, oh, that seam, that's going to be a challenge. I think. It's a running stitch, so it's actually fairly... I just, as long as you can follow the line, it's a running stitch. So it's actually relatively straightforward, I think, I hope. Yeah, and we've got the advantage of having Trudy done that and taken it out and understanding when you fold that strap, you're doing it so that the one side will see the seam and the other side won't have a seam. Yeah. Yeah, that was very hard to figure out. Yeah, that was that was a yeah, definitely a three o'clock in the morning. Oh, that's well. If they had said that in the darn instructions, you know, they said, okay, your two sides of this strap are going to look different. I'll, I'll be turning up at your house with the straps, Trudy. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I think we're at the end of our time. So thank, thank you, you all so much. I'll um I'll be online again. I know we've got a time where we're skipping. Today is we're back on the eighth, Anne. We're back on the eighth of January. It says on your email. Hang on. Yeah. Yeah. Oh no, hang on. That but, yeah, the online group will meet the eleventh of the twelfth, which is today, eighth of the first and twenty second of the first. Yeah. So if anybody needs any help, email me. Um, and just yeah, yeah, that we can set up a time to do a Zoom call or we can just email back and forth or yeah. Thank you. And Mino, you know, I'm gonna send that email right now. I appreciate it. Thanks. Feel better, Anne. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. And I hope yes, everyone and heals up. Too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone.